Hi, and welcome to another Hasselberg webinar. Thank you for joining us and welcome. So today we are looking at Hasselblad lens design and we've got our guest Per Nordland from uh, the Hasselblad um, lens R&D team. He's our lead optical designer. So we're going to uh, introduce ourselves to Per in a few seconds. I just wanted to go through um, a little bit of an introduction for today's webinar. So it's aimed at photographers and creatives who would like to know more about Hasselblad's lens design process and give you the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, as for levels, um, it's for all levels really. Uh, beginners would hopefully still find it interesting and be able to follow along. And hopefully there's some more advanced sort of facts and technical bits in there for to satisfy the advanced uh, users as well. Uh, just to give you um, notice that this is actually being recorded, this webinar, and uh, it will be uh, posted on the Hasselblad YouTube channel um, a few hours after the webinar finishes. So if you want to go back and look at any uh, of the bits again, uh, you can find it on there. A little bit of an agenda. So we're going to start off by looking at some um, lenses from Hasselblad's history. Um, we feel that that's a nice little trip down memory lane uh, for some of the lenses there. And um, in many ways, they form the basis for the lenses we've got today. So we're then going to have a little look at the H system lenses, the X system lenses, and then we're going to bit, give you a bit of a rare glimpse um, at the design process. And we're going to take the 30 millimeter XCD lens as the example for that. And then we'll talk a little bit more about optical design and some of our quality control. Uh, we're estimating this to be about 45 minutes if we can fit it all in. And hopefully that will give us some time for some Q&A at the end. And then just before we bring Per in, I um, just wanted to give you a little bit of a shout out for the, um, the Hasselblad YouTube channel. So um, if you've missed any of our webinars from the past few weeks, you can see them all again on there. And as I say, today's will also be on there within a few hours. So Per, good afternoon. Hello. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. This is actually my first webinar of this type, so it will be interesting. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I understand you've put your midsummer break on hold for a couple of hours to be able to join us today. So thanks very much for that. So you've been with Hasselblad, <laughs> since, <laughs> it's been with Hasselblad since 1989, is that right? Yeah, yeah. That's amazing <laughs> or scary. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And you're based in our Gothenburg office in Sweden? Yep, all the time. Yeah. And have you worked on lenses ever, all, all the time you've been with Hasselblad or have you, have you moved at all? No, it's basically lenses or, or optics in general, you could say. It's, it's uh, optics things related to cameras, to, to focus metering, all, all kinds of things like that. Okay. Viewfinders and so on. Yeah. Great. So um, let's and also move on. Lens testing, maybe I should mention. It's also lots of lens testing has been over the years. Okay. So let's look at the Kodak lenses to start with, the 1600F. Uh, did you want to talk yeah. us through something? Yeah, they, we have many lens models to cover. So let's start from directly from the start. As you know, most of you perhaps know that the, the Hasselblad cameras were launched in 1948 with the 1600 model. And that one was, was launched with a lens series from Kodak. They were all named Ektar. It, it, the launch program was the 80 and the 135 millimeter lens. And there was also a wide field lens, 55 millimeter and a 254. Both of them were prototypes. And as far as I have seen, they were never manufactured. So it, this was in fact quite a tiny system. Uh, if you just look at this picture, you can see that the, the wide angle 55 was actually somehow intended to produce, protrude into the camera. And I don't really understand how that was supposed to work because there was no mirror lockup mechanism in the 1600 cameras. Mm. So yeah, it's also, if you look at the design, it was not a, not a spectacular lens. So maybe it's good it stayed a prototype. Okay, yeah, and then we moved on yeah. to some uh, Zeiss lenses. Yeah, and then in, in uh, 51, uh, there was a change to Zeiss lenses, a little bit in, in at the same time as the camera was upgraded to 1000F. 
And uh, according to rumors, the one reason to switch to size was that the Kodak lenses were too expensive. I think that the dollar exchange ratio was not nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that the, the launch lenses here, that was the 80 millimeter Tessar, four element type, and the 135 Sonar. I suppose they were actually quite similar to the earlier Kodak lenses. And then there was a 250 also from launch, and uh, a Distagon was introduced in 1954, a 60 millimeter Distagon. Uh, so that was the first wide angle offering we had for these cameras, 1954. And mm -hmm. um, maybe we could just say something a little bit about this uh, Distagon lenses. Uh, wide angle lenses for uh, lens, uh, single lens reflex cameras at that time, that was tricky. Uh, you had to do this by a design type called retrofocus, where you have a large airspace at the end for the mirror box. And this design type was pioneered by the French manufacturer Ange in uh, 1950. And the first design for us then from size was in 1954. Okay, then we, we, we um, move on to, to pick out the Biogon 4.538. Yeah, this one uh, was next in line, produced in 1954. That was actually the first camera we had with a leaf shutter in the lens. The other, the earlier cameras had a focal pane shutters. And, and it was the, as this says here, the first lens introduced for general use with a field of view of 90 degrees. And it's a really good performance of the entire field, low distortion. And uh, this design, you can say that basically it remained in production until 2005. There were some changes due to material regulations and so on. So this is, uh, I would say, this is a true classic in, in the photo world. And it's certainly one that is worth to highlight a bit in a presentation like this. So what um, part did, um, or what involvement did Hasselblad have in the lenses at this stage? Were we actively involved? I would, involved say, in I would say that uh, in, in a lens like this, like shown here, I think we would probably not have very big involvement in the design of the lens itself. Uh, of course, the fitting of the lens to the camera and how, how the shutter and the camera would synchronize and so on, that is, of course, our, our part of this. But uh, uh, I, I would guess that the lens design was actually quite uh, done by Concise. Okay. And then we can look at the design a little bit more with the, uh, yeah. the diagram here. Yeah, first the, the layout plot to the left and, and then the, an old cut through drawing from Colsize. So this is the first version for the 1954 introduced su Supreme wide camera. Okay, I'm sorry, just stop me there. Um, we've had a few questions saying that people can't see any images or audio. Uh, is, we just wanted to check that it is working for some people. Um, if you could give us some uh, indication of whether it's working or not. It seems to be working okay from our end, but obviously it could be a different story externally. Like a few of you that can see us could just put through a couple of questions just to let us know that it is working okay. Yeah, okay, it is working. So um, yeah, sorry, if you're having problems, then uh, maybe try rebooting your GoToWebinar software to see if that cures it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. And then we've got some of the, the, le the lens on some of our different cameras here. Yeah, some different versions of, of the super wide or SWC camera there were different names over the years uh, the one in the middle is the type that was used uh, in the Gemini missions okay uh, yeah. yeah for the for the spaceworks uh, the one to the left is the first one of course my favorite might be the one in the middle at the top in the chrome lens I think it's a really cute camera in, in general, uh, this is a classic, I would say. And it's yes. still fully usable with high performance. 
And then we've got an example of how it would have been well, uh, used on the spacewalks. So did they use this mainly for its wide angle? Yeah, I suppose they were probably quite close to these things. They, they were used here apparently to, to document the docking procedures. So that was one part of the Gemini program. Um, I think this is a very nice image. It looks almost like some kind of boyhood spacecraft yeah or an alligator yeah yeah it does look like something out of a, a, a tv or a movie yeah yeah so then we got on to the the iconic 500 c cameras yeah so As lots, you can of see, lots of yeah lots of models to cover here i can't go into details about all of them but uh, so if you have specific questions please send them in you can perhaps see here that the 500C camera was launched in 1957, where we made kind of a complete. Uh, we went to, to leaf shutter cameras in general. So this entire program was either new design or, or uh, redesigned with leaf shutter in the lenses. You can see that there is a lot of activity in the wide angle end. The 60 millimeter lens gets new specifications a number of times during this period. Uh, the, the 40, which you could say is uh, the first really wide angle lens in our program. It's uh, easy to forget nowadays when you have access to very extreme wide angles for SLR cameras that uh, at this time that was something very rare. So it took 10 years from 1957 until we had a really wide angle lens for the 500 cameras. There are some really interesting types here. We will discuss the 60 bygone for the lunar surface a bit later. Uh, there were some other lenses that were kind of initiated by the space program. The UV sonar 100 lens. I actually myself only saw it as a mock-up, never a real one. And also the 250 Super Acromat launched in 1972. Was, that design was also initiated by the space program. Yeah. Okay. Again, a lot of these lenses are still good today. They can still be used yeah, on, yeah, our, yeah. Um, on the X1D, for example, with the XV adapter. Yeah. I mean, the 80 here from 1957, still fully usable the 150 sonar 1957 really good lens the 250 sonar was introduced in 1954 actually i would still say it's quite a good lens uh, so so these were robust good designs okay then we're going to pick out the the 5.6 uh, 60 Fiagon again to have a closer look yeah uh, this one, uh, as you might know, was uh, designed specifically for use on the moon surface. It, it seems like the NASA actually wanted something even wider. There was a, let's call it lunar version of the SWC camera with a bigger film back. And they even brought one in the, the Columbia command module. But for the surface use they actually wanted the motor motorized 500 cameras 500 el in the lunar version and they wanted a wider lens than the 80 the distagon 60 probably wasn't considered good enough and had too high distortion and they wanted the lens optimized also to work with this uh, reso plate at the rear end with with the reference crosses so then they made a redesign apparently of the 38 bygone uh, they had to take the the shutter placement outside the camera into consideration and so on and ended up with the 60. okay uh, we've got quite a good sorry we've got quite a good question actually from joseph um can we explain okay. uh, what we mean by some of the names so distagon bygone um you know sonar um, oh what do they mean good question yeah uh sonar to, for example, that, that's an old size patent. It, it was a design invented to be able to do very high aperture designs, you could say. Uh, planar is uh, 
you would call it in non-size language, a double gauss design. It was patented by a guy at size, Paul Rudolph, in 1897. So it's one of the most iconic lens design patents ever, I would say. A bygone, that's a wide angle design by size. A distagon, another wide angle design, but distagon refers to a design with a retrofocus where you have a lot long airspace behind the lens to be used on a reflex camera, which a bygone would not be suitable for. Tessar, okay. it's another patent by Paul Rudolph, 1896, I think. Yep. Okay, that's very good, well answered, thank you. Um, so we've got some of the, the charts here to show and um, the difference here between the 60 and the 38 in terms of its uh, lens configuration. Yeah, you can see here that the, the actual design, the layout, they are actually very similar. You can easily spot that the 60 is, is a kind of a redesign of the 38. You can see the, the thick glass plate at the rear with the reference crosses. The MTF curves here from the size data sheet, they are, they are good, not spectacular, but for a wide angle of this age, I think it's good. The distortion, it's a little bit tricky to see perhaps, but it's extremely low, uh, might be the lowest I've ever seen. So they wanted to be able to measure directly in the image without any thoughts about the distortion messing up their dimension values. Okay, and then as you mentioned, it was used on some of the, the lunar cameras. So here it is in the yeah. part of on the body. Wanted to uh, wanted to include a picture of the lunar surface cameras with all the strictly functional glory. I think it's a nice looking camera, and you can almost see here in the if you remember the layout I. The, showed before that you can almost see how the lens fits into the camera and then you can imagine the reference plate here. Okay then um, an image that some people might recognize um, one of the images that's shot. Yeah, yeah. Kind of it's, uh, I understand it's from Apollo 12 I think the astronaut in the picture is Alan Bean yeah. yeah and if you you enlarge it you can see that there is uh, actually lots of uh, detail uh, but it's also a bit funny if you look into the reflection here, you can see the guy shooting, you can see his own reflection aiming at himself yeah. with his yeah. camera pointing straight at you. Okay, and, and then... You um, also see these to-do lists on his arm and so on. I think it's a nice picture. Yeah, I know we've got this uh, quite large in the Hasselblad reception area in Gothenburg as well, so it's, uh, it's an image we're very yeah. familiar with. Yeah. You see it every morning when you go to work. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so this next uh, lens we're going to look at, we've actually got a question from Richard. So is the okay. Super Aquamat known for its colour correction? So maybe you could uh, uh, talk about that in this slide. Yeah, the Super uh, Aquamat, uh, as far as I've been able to um, discover it, it was initiated by the space program, but uh, as you can see, it, it wasn't launched until after the Apollo program was closed. So it wasn't used in any of the lunar flights. And they, here they, they, they request what was to have very good color correction, very low focus shift due to wavelength. And that was achieved by using calcium fluoride. And yeah. uh, I mean, today you could say that synthetic versions of calcium fluoride are easy to use or find and so on. At that time it was new. To my knowledge, this is the first uh, lens with that level of correction for color errors. Okay. This one this here shows. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, this one here shows the the you could say it shows the focusing error over a wavelength range range from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. And the, the the blue curve is the traditional sonar 250, and the curve you almost don't see is the 250 super acromat. You could say that the improvement is roughly a factor 20. And this lens also did not have the, the multi coating on all lens surfaces uh, because it affects the transmission in the infrared region too much. So it's a more traditional coating actually. 
And then we've got some more charts here to show the difference between the standard version. Yeah, yeah these are the typical style MTF curves. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with them, but it, it shows contrast transfer for three frequencies, 10, 20, and 40 line pairs per millimeter. You can see here that the super acromat is higher. That's due to mainly the much better color correction. But uh, you, you could also say that the standard 250 is still a very good lens, especially considering it was actually launched in 1954. Okay. And is the super acromat sort of uh, technology something we still use today or not? I mean, th this type of color correction, it, it's, it's achieved with other materials today. And right. it's, it's easier to reach this type of correction now than it was at that time. In 1972, this was unheard of. Mm. Uh, but I would still say that the, the 256 Super Acromat, the, the correction is, is still by today's standard extremely good. Okay, and then we've got a few more images of uh, the lenses being used in the yeah. space program. Just a couple of pictures from the space shuttle showing this, the, the type of equipment they were using. You can see super acromat lenses in both of them, two or three in each picture, I think. They were used to document Earth, Earth surface with high resolution okay. through the, the window in the, you can see the window in, in the previous one. And this is another uh, application where, where cameras were used on the space shuttle. This is, uh, I remember that we made some special spacewalk cameras to be used for documentation of the Hubble uh, telescope upgrade. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, yeah. Uh, normally they didn't take them outdoors from the space shuttle, but in this occasion at least they had uh, special cameras for that. Uh, I think w one thing we could mention here is showing the space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is that uh, this is uh, a machine to respect. It's one of the most uh, successful scientific machines in the history of mankind, actually. Mm. Soon to be kind of replaced by the James Webb Telescope that was discussed in the, in the interview with Chris Gunn couple yes, of days ago. Yep. Very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Watch so that if you do. Channel for anyone that wants to see that back. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to the 2000 FC F-type lenses from 1977. Yeah. yeah. At that time we reintroduced, so to speak, focal plane shutters in the, the cameras, a new series of cameras. We wanted to be able to have some higher aperture lenses. That's the maybe main purpose of it. And then there was a lens series for that. Uh, if you want to point out something here, the, it could be the 2.8300 telesuper acromat. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, of course, we have to mention the 1700 f4 super tele lens, yes. the biggest yes. camera lens ever designed yeah, we... and if only one of them, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, cut yeah, through. We found this information yeah. on it online, so uh, people can go and check this out at their own at their own leisure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I believe, a 203 camera at the rear end here, the small part at the, to the right, yeah. and and the final uh, application was with a 39 megapixel digital back, actually. So would you recommend shooting handheld with that one or would you need to try? No, you, you need a truck. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm actually not aware of it having ever been used for real. Oh, okay. 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 So um, moving on to the C lenses now from 1982. Yeah. And I believe this is where you come in with the 1989. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So this is about the, the kind of gradual upgrades of the C lenses to first to the CF line and then to later to CFE and CFI and CB. And here, here you can see that uh, a couple of uh, wide angles were improved with a floating design where you could improve the short range performance by adjusting an airspace. Um, there was also later the, the 40 millimeter lens with internal focusing. This is still, I would say, uh, 
extremely good lens by today's standard. And I've seen that in on second hand market it's truly expensive. There was also the 5.6350 Tele Super Acromatic, which is also an Amazon outstanding design still by today's standards. Yeah, and again, they can all still be used on the X1D with the, the XV adapter and on the H as well, of yep. course, with the CF adapter. Yep. Yeah. And I actually started in 1989, as you mentioned. So the one of the fir first things that happened was that we were evaluating the prototypes for the Sonar 180. They arrived sometimes there during summer in, in uh, 1989. Okay, and then uh, moving on to the X-Pan. So is it any coincidence that the first three lenses for the X1D were the 30, 45 and 90? No, we, we were discussing uh, about, uh, we, we wanted something like a 45, we wanted that for sure. And we were discussing what other lenses should be in a launch program, something a little bit compact telephoto and so on. We were discussing 1995 and so on, but we decided that X-Pan, it was really a popular system and why not just use the same focal length set as for the X-Pan. This one was a 1989 panoramic camera. Many of you might know it. Very popular at that time and I believe still quite popular. Yeah. Uh, and this camera was designed and produced in cooperation with uh, Fuji in, in Japan and uh, and together with a Japanese manufacturer called Nitto. Yep. Yeah, we actually know from our registration data that we've got some XPAN users on the webinar today. So that's that's good. Yeah, we have got some out there. Yeah. I actually thought if, at that time in this period, I, I always had the impression that the, the XPAN 45 lens was the best value for money lens in the camera business. It's what, it was really a good lens and that actually quite affordable I think. Mm. Very compact as well. Yeah very nice design. Mm. So something a bit more modern day now is the uh, the H lenses so 2002 onwards and obviously still part of our range today. Yeah yeah here, here we went to the six by four and a half format uh, we had a new shutter, electromagnetic, uh, with a shorter shutter speed and also bigger diameter available. And they are produced and uh, designed together with Fujinon. And uh, from, uh, you could say from HCD 28, uh, we, we designed them a bit more with digital photography in mind, the first lenses were designed for film use, actually. Uh, but it, it's not a big difference in, in uh, film and digital design for this kind of lenses with a long space at the rear. The launch program here was the 35, the 80, the 150, and the zoom 50, 110. And then other lenses were added and some types were later upgraded for high performance. Okay, and they, they all had an upgrade, was it a couple of years ago now, with the, the new shutter as well, to go up to a thousandth of a second? Yeah, thousandth of a second, and also to allow what we call a combined shutter together with the H6 camera, Yeah, where we can increase the shutter speed. One step. So a second. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then we got a diagram of the 3590 zoom lens. Yeah. Yeah, just to show some more lens layouts, they are always nice. But in this case here also to, to show the lens number two from the left here, if you not count the filter, that's the aspheric element in this lens here. And at that time, at least, this was the biggest molded aspheric lens Fuji Non had ever produced. So that was kind of a technology step for, for us and for them. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, in photography, it's generally the rule that prime lenses are a little bit sharper than zoom lenses, but this one is very close. Yeah. Yeah. Not as close as the zoom lens for X1D, but uh, it's a nice lens, really. 
Okay, so you mentioned the X lenses, so let's look at those now. So, um, yeah, for our yeah. X1D range. So here we decided that we would go mirrorless with the X1D. So this system is based on a 33 by 44 millimeter format, uses same shutters as the HG lenses. And they are also, the design process is led by us, but they are produced in, in Japan. And the, the launch program here was the 45 and the 90. The, the 30 was introduced at the same time, but delivery started a bit later. And I could just mention here for, for the 45, we wanted something uh, reasonably compact and uh, usable over the entire focusing range in a good way and so on. So, so it was, I think, my idea that we would uh, look at the redesign of the X-Band 45 lens, which is, is a good one. So we optimized it for, for digital use with the cover glasses in place and so on. and uh, and uh, it was later decided that we would go with this design type. And actually the guy who did the X-Band 45 lens also made the final design for this lens. So that's a nice photo history for us. Yeah, and as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the older lenses, they do in a way form the foundation for our current lenses. So obviously we learn things along the way and- uh, Yeah, so how much in this way. Yeah, in this way, it's very clear when you see it that they, they have the same heritage, the x 45 and this 45 here. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the actual design now. So we're going to use, as I said earlier, the, the 30 millimeter XCD as a, an example. Um, so yep. this is generally the, the process we go through to design a lens. So from, from scratch, from nothing to actually uh, production. Yeah, it's a schematic overview of, of the typical stages you go through. Maybe there would first be something you could call a specification stage where you discuss the suitable specification for the lens. Maybe you do some trial design to find out the suitable design direction to go. And then you go into design stage where you do the careful optical design uh, a bit mechanical design at the same time but optical design is a bit earlier but they, they depend on each other you could say and then there's usually a long evaluation stage it, it's a prototypes it's a one or two pre-production stages perhaps and then production stage where you evaluate or all production processes and how they affect performance what to improve what is good how, what is your yield what is your assembly time and and uh, adjustment time and so on okay and in, in an ideal yeah. world how sort of long would this process last for what how long would it take yeah i would say if you are you know exactly what you want from the start you find the, a really good solution immediately and you're really quick, everybody working in a good way, I would say you can do it in a year. Okay. Yeah. But typically, uh, maybe more close to 16, 18 months, something like that. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. So I believe this is sort of like a wish list of what we wanted from the 30 mil lens before we actually even tried to design it. Yeah. Uh, 30 is a good example. You could say that you, the, the basic requirements, that would be some kind of a specification stage. You, you discuss what you want, what's the format, some very rough things like this. this uh, MOD here, that means minimum operational distance. That's, yeah, close range. Uh, you decide what aperture you want, and you also have a, a lot of other limitations you have to keep in mind here. What's the shutter you're going to use? What's your mount size? What filter diameter are you hoping to use and so on? So this, this might sound like a very simple part, the first one here, but it's actually quite important because if you, especially in, in the medium format, I would say, because if you just ask for too much everywhere, you will end up with just big lenses. 
so, so the balance here about what short range do you want, what aperture do you want, and so on, it, it all has to mix in a good way to get a, a good compromise in the end that is easy to handle and so on, especially for a camera like X1D where you want everything to be reasonably compact and portable. And then yep. there, there will be more detailed technical specifications for color aberrations, MTF targets, distortion, all that, long lists like this. But I would say that the first part here is uh, important. You, you, you want the lens program that fits together and uh, where the lenses are somehow give a family feeling. And in, and in some ways, we can actually sometimes improve on these figures um, than what we expected yeah. once we get into the design stage. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. You you can always have uh, nice surprises. And uh, mm. so this is process, it, it takes a lot, lot of discussions and meetings and uh, um, and also having uh, when from, from in many cases I, I'm kind of the the uh, technical uh, project leader for these processes from Hasselblad side when it's come to the optical design and and you meet a number of optical designers perhaps for a lens program like this and you also to want to get the best out of them not just ask them for something specific this is ex exactly what i want you also want them to to say what they think is the best way to do things okay great so let's have a look um so this was september 2015 so just to give yeah, people yeah. um yeah, actually, was it, it, it was actually quite a long design process uh, mm -hmm. i mean it this is the first uh, design file i i had from the supplier in this case and this is in september so I, I would guess that this process started in in june or july and this is the first output we had it's uh, good good performance um, didn't feel finished so so design work uh, continued yep so this is then october 2015 so we've refined it a little bit yeah, here they had uh, improved performance. It was more compact than the previous one. But as you can see, maybe in this picture here, the, the angles to the sensor surface are really steep. So that was yeah. considered a problem. Is so, that because so it caused uh, color shifts? Is that right? At the edges? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lose, uh, yeah, color shifts and uh, sensitivity fall off. You could say. Okay, and then just to confirm on the MTF charts that we can see there, the, the idea is to get the lines as straight as possible, is that right? Straight and high. Right. Basically. Okay. So if I could just flick back, we can see, obviously, we've raised the height of those lines, and they're a little bit yep. straighter with that modification. Yep. And then yep. we can go forward again to November 2015. Yeah, now they had reduced the angles here to the sensor surface. Uh, this one, it's not shown here, but it was also improved at short range, maybe a little bit worse at infinity. But in this one here, it, we found out that the shutter integration would be very, very tricky. You could almost see here that you have some quite big elements close to the aperture plane in the middle of the layout. So it was still not good enough. Nope. So that was November 2015, and then we had a final, um, what do you call it, signed off design in June 2016. Yeah, the the final production file I, I have for this lens is since June. So this is more or less one year after design work started for the optical design. So this is, I would say, is a bit longer than typical, more detours than uh, you're used to but it also paid off in a really good design. You can see here that the design here is actually quite different from the previous ones. Uh, I think it's quite a unique optical design, this one. And uh, it features all the, the high quality technological steps here. It's a spherical surfaces, it's a floating mechanism, it's 
specialized glass types and so on, and they also come together with a, with a very good design to this extremely high performance. You can see here that uh, the close range performance is actually almost as high as the infinity performance. And that's so we've got even a question. full aperture. Sorry, uh, yeah. um, we've got a question from Jeremy uh, about the um, how the, the design of the camera differs to the six by six of a V system camera. So I guess the main difference is they're designed to work at a lot closer range, is that right? To the sensor? Uh, this the design of the lenses for a, a camera of this type. Yeah, the, yeah. the the big difference is is the mirror box. You have this long airspace in, in a six by six camera, especially I would say in a camera with a square image, the the mirror box gets kind of longer in relationship to the image format. So this is a, a huge difference, especially for this kind of uh, wide angle designs like we have here for some telephoto lenses it might have less effect okay and then um we compare obviously um it's not quite apples versus apples but we compare the modern day 30 against the 38 um so yeah. could you talk us through what we're seeing here yeah, we are, we are seeing again these MTF plots from image center to, to corners. Uh, they are not exactly comparable, but it's roughly the same angle of view for these two lenses. Uh, it's not exactly the same maximum aperture, but it's comparable enough. Uh, but you, you can see no, no matter how you, you Cor correct for the differences, you will end up in the conclusion that uh, the 30 is uh, superior to the bygone. It's a, actually quite a big difference, and it should be. I mean, the the bygone was la launched in 1954, but mm. uh, it's considered a extremely high performance lens. It's still good by today's standards, but still, when you see these graphs, you can see that lots of things actually happened over the years. And then that's especially if you look at the corners here, that's that's a huge difference in, in performance. Yeah. So as I was gonna yeah. say that that's sort of optically, but then obviously we have a lot more to still squeeze into the lens. So we've got the, the shutter and like the focus motors. Yeah. Yeah. The, you could see the shutter here, you can maybe see the gearbox and the motor and things like that. This is the mechanical design which is an all metal design and and to keep this kind of performance you have to be very careful about precision of mechanical parts as well actually in some of these lenses there are, there are parts that are sorted to a precision of one hundredth of a millimeter uh, and also the design is supposed to to be consistent over time it shouldn't wear in a way that makes performance deteriorate. Okay. So um, we've had a few questions actually on some of the software and how computers help us to design lenses um, from Robert I think uh -huh. asking about computers. So that brings us nicely to this next part. So this is some of the this, some of the software packages that we use for our testing. Is that right? Yeah. Th this is an overview of software available for lens design. You could say that the two on, on the top, CMAX and the Code 5, those are software used for ray tracing, which is what you use when you design the lenses. You, you trace rays, you, you calculate aberrations, you calculate MTF, and then you optimize the shapes of the lenses, the materials, the distances, and so on, thicknesses. And the other ones, they are light tools, thread or flow, they are more used for analysis of uh, illumination processes in the lenses and so on. If you want to evaluate stray light, ghost images, uh, the total system performance in that way, you have those softwares for that. So they have kind of different purposes. In, in Hasselblad, in, in Gothenburg, we use CMAX for ray tracing optimization and we use uh, FRED for uh, stray light analysis and so on. So this is just a screenshot showing CMAX. Uh, it's, it's a 
just a catalog uh, double gauss lens here you see a number of editors and, and analysis windows open uh, yeah it's chromatic focal shift it, it's uh, the lens data editor where you you uh, set up the lens in just a spreadsheet actually and here you can define what is variable and so on and then this is the xcd 67 yeah xcd 65 lens this is a a list of things to to vary during optimization and also what kind of targets you would typically use when you optimize so this and lens design is, is computer heavy stuff and this is then stray light analysis flare you can analyze how, how light will hit internal parts mechanical fittings and so on and how it will look in the image so this is more like an analysis of the full system rather than the, the lenses themselves. Okay, and then we've got some uh, samples, I think, of this stray light. So this is again the 65. Yeah, so, so here you can see some weak ghost images here on the, the left and right of, of the source. So this is just a strong light in, in a dark room. Okay, and then that's compared against the computer generated. It's, it might be a little bit hard for you to see on the webinar, but um, it's generally yeah, quite can. identical. Yeah, you can you can maybe see that you can actually exactly see how these things would look. And this is something you can investigate quite early in the design stage. You can find out: do we have some really bad ghost images? that might affect how you'd set up the design you might have to change radii set restrictions and you might also have to in some surfaces specify higher quality coating to reduce the the amplitude of, of some bounces and so on you can actually get something that looks almost photorealistic from this software you can also you can even get the correct color of the ghosts and so on And then we've got and the... We can, yeah, you can also use it to analyze the, the bokeh look, how the outer focus, what it actually looks like. You can analyze that long time in advance. And then we show the, you can the see color ring. Yeah, yeah. this outer focus blurs here, you can see that. Uh, yeah, maybe not easy to see here, but actually the, the, you can simulate exactly what this looks like very early. Okay, and then another thing we look for is the, the starburst. Yeah, so this one is also for this type of uh, software that, like FRED, for example, in this case, that you can simulate the effects of, of the bounces from uh, aperture blade edges and so on, what it will look like as you stop down. Okay, so um, that's pretty much um, it for the presentation. So what we'll do now is... Um, We'll just go to some of the questions, if that's okay. So okay. Uh, Shira is asking, um, can you please explain a bit more about what a floating mechanism is? Uh, floating mechanism, like in, in the 30 millimeter lens, for example, you could say that you, you move the entire lens package for focusing, but during this focusing movement, you have one airspace that you vary to to improve performance as you go to closer range. So there, there's one or more airspaces that are varied during the focusing movement. If okay. that's good enough as an explanation. Yeah, that's good for me, yeah. Hopefully it is for um, Shira as well. Uh, so David, uh, what tools did we use before computer programs were available? Oh, good questions. Uh, I think at size they started to use computers uh, sometimes in the 1960s but uh, I mean th there were computational machines before that if you read up about the sonar design for example the guy who, who was the mastermind behind that in the 1930s he had a, a number of people doing calculations for him with 
calculation machines. So they have big piles of, of books where they did the calculations and noted the results. And to be honest, I don't actually understand how they could do that in that way. That way, but it's uh, amazing work how they did it. Must have been uh, so many man hours for a lens design of good quality at that time. Yeah. Now it's com more computer hours and also man hours, but I mean, at that time it could take maybe a whole department to do a good lens. Hmm. Now it's more like a one or maybe two man job. Okay, and less wastage in materials, I guess, because you can simulate it a lot more before you actually start producing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, um, a question from Sanford. Um, what challenges did we have in design in the XCD21? Was it quite a challenging lens to design, being quite wide angle? Yeah. Yeah, I'd still I, I don't think I could say that we had some special challenges. It's a challenging focal length, but I think that the, the, it was still quite a smooth design process. We, we saw quite early that we could achieve really good performance. And uh, for example, the, the coma correction, chromatic correction for, the, for this lens, I would say is as far as we could judge from the competition analysis is maybe a factor two better than any comparable lens. So uh, yeah, it's a good one. It's really a good one. What what is your favorite lens out of the XCD range? Is it not necessarily that you like to use, but in terms of what you achieved in the design and the performance of it? I I would say that I, I still consider the 30 to be a very nice lens. It's super high quality and quite compact. Very nice characteristics in many ways. Uh, for my Personally, I, I, I always tend to find that images taken with the 90 have a very nice look to them. Mm. Not a tricky design task as the 30, but uh, I just like the look from that lens. Maybe it doesn't mean it's my favorite, but uh, I, that's something I always find it, it looks nice. Okay, and then a, a message, uh, sorry, a question from Graham. Um, he's hearing that the XCD 45P is a great lens. What makes it so good? What's different with the 45P to the other XCD lenses? The 45P? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the compactness, of course, mm -hmm. makes it very attractive. And, and also, I would say that it's a very nice mix of very high performance. It, it's really high performance in a compact shape and also good performance over the focusing range. So it's a very nice lens for everyday use for almost whatever you would like to do. Okay. Yeah. And then um, a question from Max. Um, how challenging was it to get the 1.9 aperture on the XCD80? Very, <laughs> very challenging. It's tricky to get that aperture when you have the shutter. Maybe not exactly because the limitation of the diameter of the shutter, but you have a lot of restrictions due to the shutter shape that affects the lens design in that area. So it uh, makes things more tricky. Mm -hmm. And then also for a lens like that, you have to pay a lot of consideration to how easy will this be to manufacture, to, to keep high performance of a lens with this aperture. You have to know in a very good way before that you have an adjustment process that will be efficient enough to keep high performance in production without spending too much time on each and every lens. That's really, really tricky for a lens like that. Okay, um, just a couple more questions before we wrap it up. So another question from, is it 
um, GIG, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, what is the main difference between designing lenses for film and digital? I think deep down, it's not really a big difference. Uh, it's just about making the, the, the performance in the image plane as good as possible. But there are, of course, things you, you think a little bit different about. Uh, you would, uh, I mean, one obvious difference is that in digital systems, you have these cover glasses, uh, infrared cut filters and so on, that you have to take into consideration. But uh, you, you, you probably, I would say, you think a little bit differently for some of the aberrations. In, in the digital system, you know that you can and will probably correct the image afterwards with the correction profiles in focus or in Lightroom or whatever. So you would probably balance the aberrations a little bit differently in a film lens towards, compared with a digital lens. It's, it's difficult to describe in a, in a good way, but you, you balance it a bit differently. Okay. And then we had another question earlier. Sorry, I can't quite remember who it was from, but um, would we um, still expect the old V system lenses to resolve for our 860 100 megapixel camera? Are they still good for that? It depends, uh, of course, a little bit on which type you, mm. you mean, yeah. but a lens like uh, the 250 Super Acromat we discussed before easy, no problems at all. Many of them would do this just fine. And so, then some of the older ones, uh, like the, let's say the original 40 Distagon, maybe that's not the one I would use, but for many of them, they are still surprisingly competitive. Hmm. Okay, that's a good question to wrap up on. So thank you very much Per, for your time and we'll let you get off your Midsummer break. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, and thank you very much. Thank you. It's been very interesting. So, just to wrap up, um, just another reminder that this will be on the Hasselblad YouTube uh, channel within a few hours, hopefully, uh, along with all the other webinars. So, please catch up if you've missed any. And then, just a little shout out for the Hasselblad website. Um, if you're interested in any future webinars and events that Hasselblad put on, you can find information on there, along, of course, with all our products and details on our retail partner network. Um, we've got lots of inspirational stories on there and also a lot about our history. Uh, the space program that we touched on in this webinar is uh, on there in a lot of detail. So if you're interested in that, and then you can also sort of request a demo and support as well for any existing products you may have. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you again next time. Thank you.